sentences. So we break that sentence down into a noun phrase, the boy, which is the subject of the sentence, and a verb phrase, is eating some cake. Now the boy, the subject, can be further broken down into a definite article, the, and into um, a noun, boy. Uh, the verb phrase is broken down into the verb itself and, the, and a noun phrase which forms the object of the sentence. So the verb is is eating, which has an auxiliary part is, and a present participle eating. And the noun phrase, some cake, has got a partitive article, some, and a noun, cake. And so um, when we hear a complete sentence, we automatically break it down into its constituent parts and extract meaning that way. We don't absorb it as a whole. We actually break it down. Uh, so I've just put this into a diagram here um, because uh, when we are constructing a sentence, all we do is reverse the process of passing it. So constructing a sentence um, is the opposite of understanding a sentence, simply the same process reversed. And we start off here on the left hand side of the screen, and I'm sorry about the colours, but uh, I couldn't do it any other way. Um, we've got uh, three semantic concepts floating around in my head at the moment. Eating, cake, boy. Right? Now we have to get those in order. Uh, and so we have to put them in a, the proper order that I want to express. Boy, eating, cake. And that's in the English language. If we have them in some other order, like cake, eating, boy, that is not quite the same sentence. That's actually a different sentence. So in order to express any sentence, we've got to get the semantic concepts in the order we want them. Then the next step is to start to add the um, uh, constituent parts to the sentence. So we add a bit to the verb to convert it into a um, present tense. And then in the next step, we add the articles, the to boy and some to cake, and then those are assembled into the complete sentence, the boy is eating some cake. And when that sentence is uttered and it goes through the air and impinges on your ears, you reverse that process. You break it down and to understand the meaning. And so the sequential construction of sentences is a mirror image of um, an understanding or a sentence by passing it. Now we're going to relate that to the brain. This gets a bit complicated. I'm going to say that those two, first two steps, the conceptual space, are prefrontal cortex. Uh, the second step, the when it's starting to add bits to it, um, they take place in Luria's premotor language organizer. And these um, constituent parts are then forwarded to the cortical speech centers one after the other, and the sentence is assembled, and the instruction set the neuronal instruction set of that sentence is then sent downstream to the diencephalon, mesencephalon, uh, to the cerebellum and out to the afferents of the um, speech organs. So all you're doing, all we're doing with language is transferring um, knowledge from my mind to yours. I'm simply transferring a series of concepts, semantic concepts, um, eating, cake, boy, and I am putting them in order and transferring them to your mind so that you understand, and that's all language is. Now, uh, in this model, the philosophy of language, unfortunately, is obsessed with truth, when truth is only one of many language functions. And some of these functions I've listed here are emotions, salutations, exclamations, questions, declarations, propositions, and, of course, lies. Don't forget lies, so that if I've got in my semantic space, sorry, the semantic space in my mind, I've got a number of concepts which I don't want you to get, then automatically I generate a sentence which will conceal those sentences, those concepts from you. And that is an essential part of language. Mental disorder, um, uh, all I'm going to do is propose a test for any theory of mind. If a theory of mind cannot generate a model of mental disorder, discard it. And I don't believe Danette's theory, uh, theory of functionalism or Searle's natural biological, uh, sorry, biological naturalism can generate um, models of mental disorder, and I believe they should be discarded on that basis alone. Um, I won't go into that now because we're going to run out of time. And uh, so just to conclude, um, the biocognitive model of mind for psychiatry uh, rests on a single crucial point, that is to say that we can um, give an explanation for the means by which information passes from mind to body 
and back again. And we can solve the mind-body problem, but it automatically leads to a dualist interactionist model of mind in which the, uh, within normal limits, normal physical limits of the brain, the psychological imperatives dominate the physical imperatives. That is to say that um, mental disorder becomes a psychological phenomenon. Now this model of mind is far, far and away the most highly developed model of mental disorder in the history of psychiatry and I would commend it to you on that basis alone. I've just put some references here up the top. Uh, the first three references are three books I've published which outline this, the this work in much, much more detail. Um, the last two, there's a uh, paper, uh, Kandel's New Science of Mind and the Limits to Biological Reductionism, which is published in Ethical Human Psychology and Psychiatry in 2008, and Monist Models of Mind and Biological Psychiatry, which criticizes Danet and Searle, will also be published in Ethical Human Psychology and Psychiatry uh, later this year, which is 2010. So the, um, that one is not yet available. Thank you.